says the Mishnayas in Tractate Tahnit that five terrible things happened on Tisha B'Av on the 9th of Av. Uh, the truth is that later on in history, all kinds of terrible things happened as well. Um, the declaration of the First Crusades began on Tisha B'Av. Uh, the 10,000 Jews were murdered in the first month, right, in, in 1095. Uh, the expulsions of the Jews from England in 1290, the Spanish Inquisition in 1492, declaration of the First World War in 1914, which of course was a precursor to the Second World War without any doubt. If anybody knows any European history, you'll know that, uh, you know, one, one without the other. Um, deportation of the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka in 1942, right? So, you know, Tisha B'Av is a very, it's a very bleak day. It's a day that's... Uh, you know, it's got a lot, of, a lot of terrible Jewish history inside of it. The Mishnah says the five things that took place was Betisha Ba'av, Nigza, Alavusenu, Shaloyi, Kansula, Aretz. The, uh, the Maraglim, the spies, came back and the decree was made that they're not going to go into the land of Israel. Vachorov, Ba'is, Arish, Ba'is, Rishona, Vashnir, the two temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av. The Nilkada Beitar, the city of Beitar, was destroyed um, according to some. Uh, according to some opinions, we're talking about the possibility of almost a million people being killed in the destruction of Beitar. The Nechra Sha'ir, and the whole, the whole city was just, you know, completely and absolutely uprooted and destroyed and plowed over. Those are the five terrible things that happened. Um, the Mishnah Bura writes, the Rambam writes, that the whole point of a fast day, right? Ninth of Av, of course, is a fast day. Sunday, we're going to be fasting. The whole point of a fast day is to stir our hearts, to do tshuva, and to remind ourselves that the reason why we're fasting is because of our actions. Don't imagine for one second, our boys, it's very important to understand this, but don't imagine for one second that we are fasting on Tisha B'Av because of something which happened, you know, 2,000 years ago with the destruction of the Second Temple, what we're fasting on Tisha B'Av is the continuation of that destruction, which means we could have rectified all of that. The temple could have been built. The Jerusalem, the Jerusalem Talmud says very clearly that any generation that the temple is not built in, it's as if they destroyed that temple, which means that we have ourselves to blame. Um, and we should be doing tshuva, right? The whole idea of fasting is the idea of, of uh, you know, a little bit of introspection and a little bit of self-awareness. And, uh, and perhaps becoming better people than we were before. Gemara says that uh, you know, it's not enough for a person to wear sackcloth and, uh, and to fast. A person has to understand it's got to have an impact on them. It's got to turn them into something else altogether. Right? Which is, you know, the idea of fasting is something that's very fundamental. So let's have a look and see what we've got. This year is going to be a little bit different from most other years because this year Tisha B'Av actually falls out on Shabbat. We don't fast on Shabbat. So we are going to fast on Sunday instead, which is the 10th of Av. Right now, because we, if, it, if, it, if the 9th of Av was on a regular day and we would be on the 8th of Av, we would be getting ready to fast. So towards the evening, before sunset, we would have something so called a Sudam Afseket. A Sudam Afseket is a meal that's eaten specifically to bring in the fast. It's normally eaten with an egg, with a bagel, something round. Um, if anybody here, you know, I hope you're not aware of these customs, but perhaps you are, that when a mourner, the first meal that a mourner eats after they come back from the burial is what's called a sudat avra'a, which is a meal that contains something round inside of it, right? Roundness, food, round, round food is the symbol of, of life, the same way that being born is a part of life, dying is also part of life, that cycle that brings us round again. Um, <clears throat> however, because this year is Shabbat, so there is no Su'uda Mafseket, which means that Mir Hashem on Shabbat, in the afternoon, you will eat the third meal in the regular fashion. There's actually no restrictions whatsoever, which means if you wanted, you could actually have a meat Su'uda Shlishit, um, Whatever, whatever you fancy, wherever you're eating, the only restriction there is, is that you need to stop eating before sunset. Now, sunset, I think, in Yerushalayim is at 7.44, which means that you have to finish your meal by 7.44. Right? Aside from that, again, no restrictions whatsoever. Um, you can, uh, you can, you can uh, eat whatever you want.
What? So if is like less, should be less than you should be eating? I don't hear what? So at 7.44 should be the last thing you should be eating? At 7.44, you need to be finished, right? So which means you've got to start before the third meal on Shabbat afternoon. That's why what you'll find that in all, all the communities that I know of, the last mincha in the afternoon is going to be earlier than usual. Right? Because normally the mincha in the afternoon on Shabbat afternoon is early enough to allow you to be able to come back and start Surah Shlishit before sunset. And then you can eat. For, you know, on a normal Shabbat, you can eat. Even when it's still dark outside, you can carry on eating and go to Daven Mariv later on. However, because of uh, Tisha B'Av, what's going to happen is most communities are going to Daven Mincha early to allow you enough time to be able to come back to have a meal and to be finished before 7.44. Okay? Yes? Good, okay. Uh, food in your mouth. At 7:45, what, what happens? <laughs> but like, say you can just like at 7:44, just yeah, stuff your like cheeks with food. <laughs> 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 You're gonna be like a chipmunk. Yeah. <laughs> just don't, just don't, don't, don't laugh. That's all. Of course, it's digital, so you won't be laughing. Uh, no, you should not be doing. That. You should be swallowed by them, please. I would actually recommend, it's just my personal recommendation, which means you can take it or leave it, but I would actually recommend that perhaps the last thing you do before 7.44 is drink water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But don't, I mean, really, we're very pluralistic over here, so please feel free to, uh, please feel free to do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> what is going to happen is like this. Now, this year, again, because it's going to be on Motsoi Shabbat, so when Shabbos goes out, there's no Havdalah made at home straight away, as is normally the case on Saturday night. But rather, we are going to get ourselves ready to go to shul. Shul is going to, the davening is going to be later than it normally is. <clears throat> now, I don't know what time they're going to be davening over here. I don't know exactly. But let's say, for example, Shabbat goes out at, I don't know, when does it go out? 8.15, let's say. Um, so they'll be they'll probably be davening 15 or 20 minutes after that time in order to allow you to make sure that Shabbos is completely out, there is then, you should take off your leather shoes and put on non-leather shoes, right? Whatever they are, whether they're canvas shoes, whether they're Crocs, whether they're plastic flip-flops, whatever that doesn't make any difference. That's just they shouldn't have any leather in them at all. And you should take off your Shabbos clothing, take off your Shabbos suit and get back into everyday clothing, right? Because we're, going, we're moving now into a mourning period, we're not going to mourn wearing our Shabbos clothing. Okay? Yeah. Does that mean belt too? No, belt? You can wear a leather belt. You just can't wear leather shoes. Okay. What's going to happen is you're going to get to shul. Now, again, depending on where you're davening, depends on when the bracha over the candle is going to be made. Right? Because it's Saturday night. Normally, have dollar on Saturday night. What happens normally is that you... You recite a paragraph, and then you make a brocha over the wine, then you make a brocha over the spices, and you make a brocha over the light. Because it's Tisha B'av, so we don't begin with the first paragraph at all. We don't recite a brocha over the wine because we can't drink it. We don't recite a brocha over the spices because the spices are there in order to help us alleviate the pain of the Neshama Yatera leaving the body. And we're not alleviating anything on Tisha B'av. It's okay to be in a state of anguish. And the only thing that's left to do is to make the bracha of Bori Ma'ori Ha'esh over a candle. That will be made in shul. Right? Whether it's made, normally normally it's made right before they begin to recite Eicha, which we'll talk about in the Mitzvah, we'll talk about it. But that's, you know, after you've finished Mairiv and you've recited the Amida and you said the Atachanon Tanu, then before they read the Megillah of Eicha, they're going to recite the Brocha of Borim Eish, and someone will recite it out loud, and you're supposed to say, Amen. Um, what is going to happen is like this. Davening, you're going to come into shul, there won't be chairs to sit on. <clears throat> right? If you're lucky, then maybe they'll have little kindergarten chairs to sit on something low. Otherwise, bring a pillow with you to be able to sit down on the floor, because we don't sit down on regular chairs until midday on Sunday. Right? You'll come into the shul, you'll find that the parochet, which is the curtain that covers the ark, has been taken down, or at least pushed to one side. And 
the lights will be dim inside of the shul. Those are all the preparations for Tisha B'Av. We're in a state of mourning. We're not happy, right? And uh, we come into shul. We daven Mayriv in the regular way. So all of Mayriv is the same. The evening service, we get to the Amida. We, the only thing we add into the Amida is the prayer for Saturday night of Atachon Antanu. And then at the end of the Amida, Kaddish will be recited. And at that point, then they'll make the brach of Borim Oreh Eish for the Havdalah candle. And then they'll recite Megillat Eicha. <clears throat> now Megillat Eicha is the book of Lamentations. It is going to be read with a very special tune, a very, a very haunting melody that's used in the, you, you know, when laning the Megillah. And it will normally it's laned pretty slowly. There are five chapters. <clears throat> and then afterwards, there are a limited amount of what are called kinot that are recited afterwards. If my memory serves me correct, I think there are five of them. And uh, after that, that's it. Davening is then over. Now, again, you've got to remember, it's Tisha B'av. What can't you do? You can't learn Torah, which means that you people are going to be at a loose end, you know, because you spend your days and your nights studying and plumbing the depths of the Torah. And I know that it's going to be very, very difficult for you on Saturday night not to be able to do that. But nevertheless, what can you do, right? Of course, um, you should not be going out on Saturday night to be having a good time anywhere. That's not the time, not the time to do it. Um, I mean, the simplest thing really is to maybe to take a book that deals with the, you know, Tisha B'Av related things or Holocaust related and uh, maybe try to read that. Um, and uh, otherwise, you know, there's not very much that can be done at all. You can sleep, for sure, right? You can't study Torah. The only Torah that you can study is destruction related. So it's, it's permitted to learn the book of Eicha, right? The, the Megillah of Lamentations. It's permitted to learn various little sugiot inside of the Talmud that talks about the destruction of the temple. So, for example, in Gitin, in the tractate Gitin, it talks about it. It's okay to do that. It's also permissible, actually, to learn the book of Job, Eov, right? Because that's also a book which is really, really not very, uh, not very upbeat, <clears throat> to put it mildly. Um, but aside from that, you really, you can't learn very much at all. Uh, there's not very much you can do. Um, Tisha B'Av, what do we do? You get up in the morning. Now again, you can't eat, you can't drink that much, we all understand. You can't wear leather shoes. Um, when you get up in the morning, all of these things, of course, are forbidden for the entire Tisha B'Av period. Right? So not eating and not drinking, not wearing leather shoes and not learning Torah, all of that is forbidden for the whole of the Tisha B'Av period. Um, what will happen is that it's just in general that we should understand what's going on. At midday things become a little bit easier. So at midday, it's okay to be able to sit down on regular chairs. <clears throat> you don't have to stay sitting on the floor. From midday onwards in the morning, we'll learn about this in Mitzvah Hashem, but from in the morning on Tisha B'Av, we do not put on tefillin, right? And from midday onwards, you can put on tefillin, which is why tefillin are worn at Mincha on Tisha B'Av, regardless of when you pray Mincha, whether you pray straight away at the beginning of the afternoon or whether you pray at the end towards the evening. <clears throat> Whenever you pray, you're going to be putting on your tefillin then and you're not going to be putting on your tefillin in the morning. Washing. What do we do about washing? You get up in the morning and you do not wash your hands in the regular way that you wash your hands. Normally when we get up in the morning, we wash our hands with copious amounts of water. Um, we wash up to our wrists and everything is great. Uh, on Tisha B'Av in the morning, you are not supposed to be washing your hands all the way up to your wrist. You should wash only up to the second knuckle over here, right? Just the, the fingers themselves. You should avoid washing your hands throughout the whole of Tisha B'Av unless they're very dirty, right? Of course, if you've got your hands dirty doing something, then for sure you should be washing them. But under normal circumstances, if you haven't got your hands dirty, you should avoid washing them throughout the whole of Tisha B'Av. When you go to the bathroom, of course, when you come out of the bathroom, you should wash your hands, but again, only up to your second knuckle, not more than that, because again, we're trying to alleviate the amount of pleasure we're getting. Um, you get up in the morning, you can use a little bit of water to wash your eyes out as well, right? Some people, you know, wake up with their eyes glued together with sleep. Um, some people, you know, don't like that and they get rid of it. 
you people seem to have no problems coming in here with it, so I guess <coughs> maybe, maybe it's not such a big issue. You may find uh, that some people actually sleep on the floor on Tisha B'Av, on Tisha B'Av night. Um, <coughs> what, whatever, if you, can, if you can sleep, you know, maybe if you sleep with two pillows, if you can sleep with one pillow, here in the yeshiva, of course, the yeshiva mattresses are renowned for their softness and their, uh, their, you know, their wonderful comfort. So if you can avoid, you know, maybe if you can sleep with only, with, you know, only, only five of them instead of 25 of them like you do normally, then uh, maybe that would be a good thing to do as well. We're try just trying to alleviate our comfort. We shouldn't be so comfortable on Tisha B'Av. You should not greet people with shalom. You shouldn't really shouldn't greet people at all on Tisha B'Av. Right now, if somebody comes over to you who you're not really familiar with and they say to you, Oh, Shalom, it's so nice to see you. So obviously, the correct thing is to reply back to them, you know, thank you, it's so nice to see you too. But under normal circumstances, don't greet people. They shouldn't be greeting you either. If they do, at least awkward. greet them in a subdued fashion, right? What? It's very awkward. It depends where you are. If you're here in the yeshiva, it's not really a big deal. But you know what? If you're some, some people have to go into work on, on Tisha B'Av, right? Can you imagine if you're working, work, you're manning the switchboard and it's like, you know, hello! Hello. What? I said hello. Yeah. It's interesting I'm not, working in a restaurant uh, on Tisha B'Av. I imagine it's probably a little <laughs> difficult. It's horrible. <laughs> you never want to have to do that again. I um, imagine it's a little difficult, that's for yeah, sure. I'll tell you um, what it is. Somebody, somebody walks over and they're like, hello, how are you today? I'm like, how dare you? Yeah, that would probably take care of working in the restaurant, right? Genius. Um, some people, some people do take upon themselves the custom of not going into work on Tisha B'Av at all or take off a work day. This year, you know, it falls out on a Sunday, so for a lot of people, it's a lot less complicated than it is for other days uh, of the week. Um, if it's possible, you know, again, just halacha. I don't think it's applicable for anyone who's sitting here right now, but if it's possible for the future, if you can, if you do have to go into work, but you can go into work after midday, that would definitely be preferable than going to work before midday. Um, and there is a custom to go to a cemetery on Tisha B'Av. So if you've got, you know, loved ones in a cemetery somewhere, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good day to go to visit. Uh, again, what are we doing? We're just sort of like, you know, making things gloomier than they already are. Which may not be a need, there may not be a need for that over here, but uh, <laughs> whatever, in general. <clears throat> a Cohen, no, Cohen doesn't go to, they should never, Cohen never goes to a cemetery, no, no. You're right, if you're a Cohen, then you shouldn't go to a cemetery. Well, I mean, the truth is like this, you know, so, some cemeteries, especially in London, they're very organized, and uh, some cemeteries actually have special pathways that have been built so that the Kohanim can go down them. Um, but the truth is like this, if you're, if you're going down a path, one of those paths of the Kohen, you're not really in the cemetery anyway. So I'm not quite sure what you've achieved by going on Tisha B'Av anyway, right? So I would say it's probably better not to go and to, uh, you know, to stay home and to dream about food and uh, let the other people who are not Kohanim go to the cemetery and they should dream about food in the cemetery. Well, that's what most people do, isn't it, on Tisha B'Av? <coughs> okay, when you get up in the morning, you're going to go to shul, you do not put on talis and tefillin. For <coughs> anybody here that wears a talis... Right, a talit, not, not, a, not a small talit, not a talit katan, not your tzitzit, but a talit, what's called a talit gadol. If anybody here wears a talit gadol, on Tisha B'Av in the morning, you do not put one on, and you do not put on your tefillin. Where, there's a machloikis in the about whether you should make a mitzvah, whether you should make a brocha over your, over your tzitzit in the morning. Uh, the Chai Adam rules that you shouldn't. Okay, so you just get dressed, just put on your tzitzit, and finished. What's going to be? So davening is going to be, in the morning, is going to be the same up till the moment that you get to after the Amidah, right? In the Amidah, uh, you, you, you recite the Amidah as usual, and you then, we have Kriyata Torah, which means the Sefer Torah is going to be taken out after the Amidah has been recited, and we're going to recite not the Kriyata Torah, which is recited during a regular fast day, but a special Kriyata Torah, which is read only on Tisha B'Av. And three people will be called up, right? Three people will be called up, a Kohen, a Levi, and a Yisrael. 
And then after the Sefer Torah has been taken back and put into the Oran Kodesh, we sit down on the floor and we start, we start to recite Kinot. Now, Kinot are a whole series, there's a lot of them, a whole series of special prayers that have been composed to do with the destruction. Most of them revolve around the destruction of Yerushalayim and the destruction of Beitar, um, the, you know, and the destruction of the Jewish life that existed in the time of the Temple. There are a few at the end that were composed much later on as Kinot in commemoration of the Holocaust. I don't know if they'll say them over here. If they won't say them over here, they'll be handing out books that are full of these Kinot. I actually recommend, very, very strongly recommend that you try to get a hold of a Kinot that's got an English translation because otherwise these things are going to be very difficult. They won't have a lot of meaning. <clears throat> Just everybody sitting on the floor mumbling all these things and you'll mumble together with them. But it won't have a lot of meaning. Art Scroll have got a fantastic Kinot, which has got an introduction to every single one, so you know what it is that you're saying and why you're saying it, um, and it gives it a lot more meaning. Over here, what they do in the base of Medrash is something, it's something very, uh, I, think, I think it's a great, really a great idea, very meaningful, is that they're not going to recite all of the Kinot that appear inside of the Book of Kinot. They'll take a selected amount of maybe, maybe 10 of them, perhaps, and I think uh, Rabbi Breitowitz will be explaining them before they recite it and explain the historical context of what's being said. And he'll give his own overview and insights into the kinna itself before it's being recited. The whole idea you should know, however trying this is going to be for you, however difficult it's going to be, you should know that the whole function of the kinot is that it should be trying. Right? It should, be, it should really be a pain. It really should. And we should feel the pain of the destruction and we should feel the pain, you know, of our own actions which have led us to sitting again on the floor each year and reciting Kinot, right? <clears throat> which means that take them slowly, take them seriously. One of the functions of the Kinot is to get us through until midday, which means there really isn't anything to do, right? If you want, you can go lie down in bed, but you'll have plenty of time to do that in the afternoon anyway. And I would really recommend that if you can, that you should stick around over here and listen, because hopefully it'll be very insightful and very meaningful. And, uh, you know, it will, it will change the way you relate to the way that you relate to Tisha B'Av. Now, after the Kinot have been recited, if you're still around at that point, <clears throat> some communities, again, you know, it's not an obligation, but some communities, they read Megillat Eicha again. Right? They read it, the, the obligation is to read it on Tisha B'Av night. But some communities will do it again in the off, you know, after they finish all the kinot towards the end of the morning. What is the point of that? Again, it's just, it's just to add another layer of anguish onto the day. And because we have nothing else to do, sitting around in shul, listening to Megillah's Eicha is definitely preferable than sitting around in, in, you know, in your dorm and, uh, and uh, talking with your roommates Maybe, maybe, you know, in a light, more light-hearted fashion and losing a little bit of the meaning of the day. Do you have to stick around? You don't have to stick around for it. You really don't. But if you do, again, it's a, it's, I think it's, it's got to... It's, you know, I, I personally, I think the tune of Eicha is very beautiful. It's very haunting. And uh, just, you know, help, helps put you in the right frame of mind. After all of that, right, what happens? So if you've stuck around throughout the whole of Davening and you've got to the end of Megillah's Eicha... <laughs> then you've really, you, you know, you've really done a great job and that's gonna, probably going to get you very close to midday. Midday now is around 10 to 1 in the afternoon. Right? Again, midday is not at 12 o'clock. It's taking the amount of daylight hours and dividing it into 12 equal hours. Uh, so right now they're longer than 60 minutes each one and it's going to get us to about 10 to 1. At 10 to 1, you, it's now midday. From midday onwards, you can now get up off the floor. You can sit down on regular, uh, on regular chairs. You still cannot change your footwear, which means you should still be wearing clo um, clothing. You should still be wearing shoes that are not made out of leather. And then <coughs> we have mincha. Right? Now, I don't know when, mincha, when you're going to dab mincha. In many shuls, they've got a few minchas during the day. Uh, some people like to daven as soon as they can, which would be at 
uh, would be the first time that you can start davening mincha. If you are going to daven mincha, whenever you're going to daven mincha, right, you should get to shul a little bit earlier in order to get yourself ready, which means that you can put on your talit. If you wear a big talit, you can put on your talit with a bracha, and you should put on your tefillin with a bracha, right? We haven't, we haven't worn those in the morning. We're going to wear them in the afternoon instead. Um, Tisha B'Av afternoon, because at Mincha time, because it is a fast, so the Sefer Torah is going to be taken out. Ashrei is recited, and then straight after Ashrei, the Sefer Torah is taken out, and the special Torah reading for a regular fast day is then read. Not the, reg- not the reading for Tisha B'Av, that was read in the morning, but rather the regular fast day reading, Torah reading that's read. It's got the Yud Gimel Midot inside of them. We say Hashem, Hashem, Ker Rachum V'chanun Erech And there's a half Torah which is recited at the end as well. Right, so three people are called up. Again, Kohen, Levi, Yisrael. And the Yisrael reads the half Torah. The person who is laning the half Torah, the people getting Aliyot, need to be fasting, which means if somebody, for whatever the reason, is not fasting, they should not take an aliyah. Okay, it's an Im- important thing just to know that. In the Amida, you've got to keep your eyes open. After the, after the Haftorah has been read, the Sefer Torah is put back, and then Kaddish is recited, and we recite the Amida. Now, what is reciting the, the The Amida is a regular Amida which is recited, but there are some extra paragraphs that are added in. The extra paragraph of Nachem, which is recited only on Tisha B'av is recited, and the extra paragraph of Anenu, which is a paragraph which is always recited when there is a fast day, right? <clears throat> and for those people who daven Nusach Ashkenaz, when you get to the end, instead of saying Shalom Rav, you say Sim Shalom. Now, if you daven Nusach Sfad, which is the Hasidic Nusach, or if you daven Nusach Sfardit, which is the Sfadi Nusach, then you say Sim Shalom anyway. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> but for those of us at Davnus Ashkenaz, at Mincha, we normally say Shalom Rav. And because it's a fast day, we say Sim Shalom. Interesting that uh, for Kohanim, we have with us uh, to show and tell a Kohen. <clears throat> the Kohanim do not go up to bless the people on Shacharit, on Tisha B'av, but they do at Mincha. Okay, which means that you're going to be performing. If there are no Kohanim, which obviously in the minion that you'll be davening is inconceivable, right? But if there are no Kohanim, or in Chutz Laretz, where they don't have the Akat Kohanim, so the paragraph of Elokeinu Velokeinu is added into the Amida, and everybody answers, Ken Yiratzon, after each, you know, Yivarecha Hashem Yishmarecha, Ken Yiratzon. Uh, there is a custom to give charity on, uh, on uh, Tisha B'Av. Actually, there's a custom to give charity on every fast day. But, uh, you know, if you, so people might be coming around asking for charity during, during the prayers, uh, have some loose change ready to give them. Interesting that some people have the custom to give the amount of money to charity what, what it would have cost them to have a meal on that day. Uh, there's, no, there's no, you know, you don't have to. You can just give away a few coins, it's fine. But it's an inter- just an interesting idea. Right? Uh, I mentioned the other day, which is something which is rather important for anybody who is not going to be able to fast on Tisha B'Av, before they eat, will have to make Havdalah. Right? What is Havdalah? To make a bracha over <coughs> a cup of grape juice, or be- even better, what's called Chama Medina. So maybe, rather than using wine, it would be preferable to use maybe beer or orange juice, something like that. Uh, in order to be able to eat. Right now it's important because regularly, if somebody's not feeling well and they have to eat on a fast day, you don't have to worry about these things because it's not normally Motzei Shabbos. But because it is, let's say a person manages to get to halfway through the day, they just, they can't go on, they're not feeling well. They have, before they eat and before they drink, they have to make Havdalah. Havdalah means just making a bracha over the cup of whatever they're drinking. So they're going to make a, if they're making a Havdalah over beer, they would make Sha'akol Niyeh Bidvaro. And then they say the final paragraph of Havdalah. And then that's it. Then they can eat. <coughs> Who gets to eat on, uh, on this Tisha B'av, which is a lot less problematic than a regular Tisha B'av, because Tisha B'av is really on Shabbos and it's all being pushed over onto the Sunday. So who gets to eat? 
Anybody who's not feeling well, um, if a, a lady is pregnant, if a lady is feeding, if a lady has just given birth, right, all of these kinds of things, you know, it's, <clears throat> if, uh, you know, so men, plenty of people that have medical conditions where it's difficult for them to fast, it's a lot easier to be lenient, you know, on this Sunday than it is at other times. But like I said, everybody needs to make sure that they're going to make Abdullah before they eat. On Sunday night, what is going to happen? So first of all, you got a shul and you have Mayriv. After Mayriv, <clears throat> you know, there is something called Kiddush Levana. What is Kiddush Levana? When we bless the new moon. Now, normally the new moon is blessed on the first Motzei Shabbat after Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh this year, uh, this month, was on Friday. It was too early to recite Kiddush Levana anyway on this last Motzei Shabbat. And you can't <coughs> recite it on this Motzei Shabbat because it's Tisha B'Av. So everyone is going to recite, uh, everyone is going to recite Kiddush Levana on, on uh, Sunday night. When? In some shuls, they recite it straight after the Amidah because that's the, uh, straight after Mayriv because that's the most convenient way to do it. However, halachically, the best way to do it is to go home, to change your footwear, put on leather shoes, and to have something to drink or something to eat, and then to go out and make Kiddush Levana afterwards. What you'll find in many shuls, many communities, let's say Tisha B'Av ends, I'm just saying, right, it ends at 10 past 8, for example, right? You'll find in many communities they'll have a special gathering for Kiddush Levona at 9 o'clock, right? So enough time to go home, make Havdalah, change out of your Tisha B'Av shoes into leather shoes, have something to eat and something to drink, and then to come down when you're feeling in a much more, you know, more settled frame of mind to come down at, uh, at uh, a little bit later on to recite Tisha, uh, to recite Kiddush Levana together with everybody else. Under normal circumstances, when Tisha B'Av comes to an end, not all the morning practices come to an end, right? So on a normal year, at the end of Tisha B'Av, we have to wait until the middle of the next day before we can start doing our washing and shaving and cutting our hair and listening to music and all that kind of stuff. However, this year, because it's really already the 10th of Av. Sunday is really already the 10th of Av. We only have to wait until Monday morning, except for eating meat and wine. Meat and wine, you should wait until Monday you afternoon. Huh? You can, but it has to be after midday. So if you're sleeping in, then you could do that. Or, of course, after, only after you've done shachrit and you've gone back to sleep, and then for sure, right? But having a, yeah, having a full English breakfast, right, on, on the Monday, on Monday, uh, of course, a full English breakfast includes pork sausages and bacon. <laughs> and uh, I think you've got other things to worry about over there, actually. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Cholesterol levels and uh, um, <clears throat> never mind the halakhic dimensions. Just pure um, suicide on a plane. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, uh, but you're going to have to wait to have your flashix, your, fir your first dose of meat. You're going to have to wait until Monday afternoon. However, Monday morning, you can start washing, you can start cleaning, you can shave all those things that you've been desperately waiting for. You can listen to music, all of those things. You can wait. You can do that already on Monday afternoon. Rabbi Sa'i, Mitzah Hashem. If we all pull our weight here a little bit and do some tshuva, right? Obviously, I'm not including myself in this. Thank you. I, um, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> But the, the, uh, the Messiah not being here, surely, surely rests with you people and not with me, surely. <laughs> but in Mir Tashem, we, don't, we do not have to fast on Sunday. Listen carefully. I don't imagine anybody really wants to fast on Sunday. Nobody does, right? We don't have to do it, really don't. All we've got to do is a little bit of tshuva and to daven properly. The Mashiach will come and that's it. We're done, finished. And in Mitzah Hashem, if we do that, Sunday, not only will it not be a fast, but it will become a Yom Tov. It'll be a festive, a festival day, and we will go down in Mitzah Hashem to the temple, and we'll be able to eat the korbanas, the sacrifices that we're going to bring in order to inaugurate the temple. We can eat them there, and it will be the most wonderful, beautiful experience. But 
it is rather dependent on everyone doing a little bit of chewer. Okay, fine, so we'll fast. What do you want, <laughs> what do you, what do you want me to do? You don't want to do tuba, so don't do tuba. Good, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna stop over here. Mitzah Shem. <laughs>